Well, welcome everyone. Um, really appreciate you coming today. Welcome back to campus to all the alums. Uh, this is a, the second of our Back to College series featuring uh, Dr. Megan Burke on seeing race in a colorblind society. And I have the great pleasure of introducing a colleague and a friend. Uh, my name is Carlo Robustelli and I direct the Grants and Foundation Relations Office. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about Dr. Burke. Dr. Burke is an assistant professor of sociology and has been at Illinois Westland since 2009. She received her PhD from Loyola University Chicago, where she earned the nationally competitive United States Department of Housing and Urban Development doctoral, doctoral dissertation research grant, along with several teaching and research awards. At Illinois Westland, Dr. Burke teaches courses in social theory, race, community and urban sociology, and qualitative research methods. Her teaching was recognized by the IWU Student Senate this past year, and she was named the 2013 Professor of the Year. Along with being an excellent teacher and mentor, Dr. Burke is also an active researcher. She recently published her first book, Racial Ambivalence in Diverse Communities, Whiteness and the Power of Colorblind Ideologies. She has also published four articles during her time at IWU, and she has recently signed a contract for a second book about race, class, and gender dynamics of the Tea Party. Finally, Dr. Burke serves the university in various uh, capacities. She co-developed and directs the Engaging Diversity Pre-Orientation Program. She serves on the University Council for Diversity, the Diversity Strategic Plan Task Force, and is a faculty advisor to the Sociology Club. So please join me in welcome Dr. Burke. Thank you very much. double mic here. It sounds like you're at least picking me up here, so let me figure out how to get... Speaking of big data, right? <laughs> There's a number of you were at that last session. It freaked me out thoroughly, uh, but I found it very interesting. I'm actually really proud because, um, as some of you may know, we're a shared department of sociology and anthropology, so it's kind of exciting for me to, to follow up one of our anthropology alum here uh, and then kind of steer in and talk about some of the work that I'm doing in sociology. It's interesting, as programs on campus, they don't even have any shared courses. There are, no, there are none that are cross-listed or, or relate with one another, but there's a lot of conversations that are sort of similar between the two, and so uh, it's a real honor to be here. Welcome back uh, to all of you to campus. So I know there's a few current students here. I appreciate you just as much uh, coming out on a Friday, beautiful fall Friday afternoon. Uh, and so I'm just really honored to be here uh, to talk to you a little bit about my work. And so I should give that caveat. I know this is called a back to college class, um, but the, for that to really be true, and those of you who have taken my classes can attest to this, I almost never do PowerPoints. When I do, I never put SpongeBob SquarePants on there. In fact, I, you know, I don't know if this will win or lose me points, but I'm not sure I've ever actually watched SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> And we'll talk about why I still chose this, this sort of graphic for this sort of glitzy, happy, colorblind thing that I'm going to depress you all by telling you is incredibly wrong for our approach to race relations in our society. But you don't have to believe me. Um, so I will be uh, holding these apart, apparently, <laughs> um, as, I, as, I, as I work and as I talk here. I think standing away from there is the key. Um, but it's really not how I run my classrooms. I don't like to just lecture. I, you know, when I need to, I will. Uh, but if you were really in my classes, you would have done a lot of homework and you would have brought in or emailed me notes about the stuff that you've read and we would be very much having a discussion. I don't want to preclude that discussion though. So please, along the way, as I'm talking, uh, feel free to jump in and raise your hand and offer a comment or ask a question. I'm going to cover, in some ways, a lot of ground here, but there's also a way in which when I have a whole semester with the students, we're able to take things kind of slowly. You know, we could spend the next 40 or so minutes on the social construction of race, how we think it's this biological reality, but really, again, you know, sharing some of the insight from anthropology that it's really our cultural lens that have taught us to place each other into these categories. I still don't know what to do with these things. <laughs> but I never know what to do with my hands during a presentation, so that's okay. Um, so anyway, those are just a few caveats before I get going here. Um, I also want to give another kind of caveat that I'm not sure um, is one to be proud of yet. Because as I'm working on this second book about the Tea Party right now, it keeps occurring to me that if I'm doing my job well, 
nobody's going to like it. <laughs> and that's because I think we're so, as many of you I'm sure can, can understand, are so deeply kind of in this partisan moment in our country right now. And it's not a new moment, right? But it's like everybody on the left wants me to prove that the Tea Party are a bunch of like irrational racists or anything like that. And the people who are in the Tea Party want, and this is part of the reason that I don't think I had a lot of trouble getting interviews, to be understood outside of that framework. And it's not really my job as a sociologist to say who's right about that stuff. What I'm interested in and what I study both within the Tea Party as well as within uh, the first book that I wrote here, I brought a copy in case anybody wants to peek at it after. I don't make any money on it. So <laughs> it's really just truly if it's of interest. Uh, and I can talk a little bit more about that later. But what I do is I study and try to understand the way that we talk and think about race in this country. And I do that because I think that that is important for our understanding of all sorts of social outcomes. And that, of course, includes things like voting beha behavior. So sometimes people, my dad comes to mind, who uh, know that I'm studying the Tea Party, you know, will say to me right now, now, what impact do you think that the government shutdown is having on, you know, the ability for, you know, Tea Party identified Republicans to get reelected? And I, I don't know, I don't care. <laughs> I mean, I care as a citizen, uh, but that's not the type of research that I do. That's not what really fascinates me about studying race and racial discourse and all that sort of stuff. Um, I really want to understand how race continues to matter. And what I've done in the two uh, research projects that I've uh, conducted um, so far is to actually, and I would love to say that I designed this on purpose, um, but it, it really just ends up being the case that I've studied two seemingly very different communities. One is the one that uh, my first book here uh, details, and that's when I was living up uh, as a graduate student up in Chicago, and I was studying racially diverse communities. Now, unfortunately, even though the nation is becoming increasingly diverse and there's a lot of talk and I think growing appreciation for diversity in our society, uh, there are actually very few neighborhoods, really like communities, places to live that become diverse and stay diverse. When we get diversity, it's usually like this flashpoint between a, a predominantly, let's say, white into a predominantly black, or Asian to Latino, whatever it may be sort of community. Usually diversity is kind of a flashpoint between two uh, sort of heterogeneous communities. But there are a few stably racially diverse communities in the nation. Four of them are Chicago. I studied uh, in Chicago. I studied three of them. And these are, you know, if you're not familiar with the communities themselves, I don't know how many of you know Chicago, but it's Rogers Park, Edgewater, and Uptown are three adjoining, right? The communities that I lived in for six years in graduate school in Chicago. And these communities really kind of brand themselves as liberal, if not progressive, sorts of communities. They're very proud of the diversity that is in their communities. I find that there, I have suggestions in the book, let me call it, for ways that that could be better uh, sort of embraced in a way that could maintain that diversity, rather than to allow it to gentrify or other things like that. I mean, there's a whole host of what I think are interesting questions associated there. But these are liberal communities, okay? And I, and I studied, and I actually am, am somewhat critical of the way that these liberal communities are talking about and thinking about race and how that connects to what they're really doing on the ground in their communities. So when the Tea Party came into popularity, um, I was already down here, uh, uh, started, had started my job here at Illinois Wesleyan, and you know, Tea Party, as I'm sure you all know, have gotten a lot of attention for the way that they are talking and thinking about race. They're doing lots of other things. I don't at all see that as a simplistic thing. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I kind of felt that as a researcher who studies this stuff, I couldn't ignore them. So here I have two uh, communities, one that kind of calls themselves and is proud to be liberal, another that, it, that calls themselves and is proud to be conservative, and it actually has allowed me a really neat opportunity to see, and this is again the bad news that if you're like very deeply seated in your partisan politics, you might not like this, the incredible commonality that actually these types of communities share. And that's because I think, of course, they're all gonna be reflective of the larger racial discourse, the larger way that we learn to talk and think about race in this country. Um, so, you know, I'm not saying that either is good or bad, uh, right or wrong, anything like that, but I'm really, I always tell my students, uh, those of you, again, who have taken my classes can vouch for this, I think the, the best question that sociology can answer is how. Not who, right, who's the racist, who's not, who's, you know, whatever. Um, 
not what, right? Oh, look, we found the racism, <laughs> but rather how, how this stuff works and how this stuff comes together. And so that's the kind of question that I uh, seek to address in my research. I'll also let you know you're gonna see some, uh, just a couple quotes. I'm a qualitative researcher, so I was really glad that if you were in the last session, you got a sort of introduction to ethnography and qualitative research. Something happens when I walk there. <laughs> uh, in the last session, so you, you have a sense a little bit of what I do. Uh, mostly, I talk to people. You know, I have a set of questions that are that as my re as you know wearing my researcher hat, I'm interested in learning more about what people are doing primarily, and then how they're thinking about what they're doing. Uh, but primarily conducting interviews. So you're going to see excerpts from those interviews, but um, as I promised the IRB and as is important in the ethical standards for my research, um, they're they're not the real names. So just sort of know that as we're going through there. So again, this wonderful question of how. How do we talk about race? How do we make meaning of, for example, in not only a racially unequal society that we continue to live in, right? But one in which, and by the way, I, as if, if uh, any of you saw my commencement address in May, uh, I, I sort of opened it by saying, I kind of depress people for a living, so I'm always really confused when I get like, you know, like accolades for my teaching or whatever, because I just, I bum people out. Uh, and so, you know, fair warning. Um, we are reaching levels of racial inequality right now that are similar to the state of the United States at the beginning of the civil rights movement. Okay. There was some improvement for a period of time. A whole host of very complex things have happened. Okay. But we are actually back to those kinds of levels. Racial inequality in our society exists and persists. This is just one measure that, uh, like many other scholars and sociologists, I think is one of the most powerful measures, and that's the racial wealth gap. Okay. Which, of course, you, know, you take all of your net assets. Most of us, uh, this is home ownership by and large, any equity that we may have in our home. You know, most of us don't have big money in the banks or anything like that. And of course, there's people from every, you know, sort of racial background who do, yes, Oprah is rich. But it doesn't mean, right, that when we look at patterned racial inequality, that it doesn't exist and persist. And in fact, it's opening up. It's growing. Those gaps are widening. And this is cause of tremendous concern. And I think here's the interesting thing about the way that we talk and think about race in this country. Most of us know that on some level. You know, before pulling up the most recent census data, maybe because I study and research and teach about this stuff, I could have guessed maybe a little bit closer or better than you around what these figures would be, right? But even if you don't have a ballpark for what these figures are, I think you look around our society and you see persisting segregation, if nothing else, right? Well, our neighborhoods, our homes, don't have the same value by and large, right? Anyone who's shopped for homes, who's thought about what, kid, what schools your kids are gonna go to, have had to think about those things, right? There's tremendous disparities in health, <laughs> experiences with the criminal justice system, educational attainment, it's everywhere, right? So again, I think most of us know that. Most of us are concerned about that. Most of us think it's a bad thing, right? The question becomes, how then do we make sense of that? And how do we uh, act accordingly? How does that shape how we talk about race? How does it shape how we vote? How does it shape whether or not we get involved in our communities or decide to stay home? Right? And of course, there's lifestyle questions and other things that come into that as well. But that's the kind of thing that we're interested in. And what you know, my work and the work of many, many others who came long before me, and it's almost like a no-brainer by now, this is something that we know, is that our discourse about race in this country okay, is primarily one of colorblindness. Sometimes it's called laissez-faire, sometimes it's, I mean, it's called, been called a whole host of different things over the years. But for the past several decades, okay, um, really since the civil rights movement, our way of talking and thinking about race has been one that wants to hold up this beautiful American ideal of equality and sort of say that we're already there, right? To say that because we had the successes of the civil rights movement, which are important and tremendous, okay, and a lot of hard work of people, <laughs> of people um, on this campus, in this community, around the nation, of all racial backgrounds, of all political persuasions, 
played an important role in making those changes. So it's not as though there hasn't been significant progress. You know, absolutely we needed to, as I say to students sometimes, you know, we needed to clean up to fix our laws, to try to create that legal framework for the racial inequality that we all want in our society, right? What happens is that we tend to learn, and we learn this as, you know, it's sort of basic sociology 101 here, but we learn, right, from listening to the media system, okay, and again, I think this happens on both or all sides, however you want to conceptualize it. We learn it in our educational system. We learn it from listening to our family groups. We learn it basically everywhere that we go in the society, this notion of colorblind ideology, right? So ideology is a way of learning to interpret reality in ways that are specific with, you could say, political or social goals, okay? And so the colorblind ideology is a way of talking and thinking about race that affirms our belief in individualism and choice, but without recognizing the many remaining barriers to equality. Okay, so uh, one, you know, there's, there's a, a scholar that I use in my work that a lot of folks have, other, have used as well, uh, has talked about the minimization of racism being one of the major frames that we use for that. Right, the past is the past, I'm a good person, I didn't own any slaves, things are so much better now, right, all has a way of kind of getting us to not talk about why and how some of this stuff happens. Or there's cultural racism, which I always say is often like, you know, like the old school racism, right? The stuff that sounds most overtly racist makes use of stereotypes, positive or negative, right? So the model minority myth for Asians is a great example of a seemingly positive stereotype that would say, well, look, these folks aren't white, and look how much better they're doing. Must be something about Asian culture the tiger mom thing, whatever it is that you want to believe. And seeing culture only, decoupled from the institutions that, for example, right around the civil rights movement started to give preference in our immigration system, okay, and selectively choosing those who were already going to become in talented and skilled in math and, and science, for example, to fuel the Cold War, <laughs> right? So we took sort of the, the best of the best, so to speak, right? from Asia, allowed them preference on our immigration system, suddenly around the 1960s, okay, you get an influx of high earning, highly educated, right? And then we look around in our culture and go, oh, must be something about those Asians. Even though, you know, several decades before, the stereotype about Asians used to be that they were inherently stupid, barbaric, we're gonna dumb down the country, you know, threats to national security, sexual threats to women, all sort of like the opposite of what we think now. And the thing is, we don't know better, usually. We're not good, by and large, in our K-12 system of teaching us to make meaning, like actual meaningful understanding of how this happens, right? This is, I think, 2010 census data, okay? So two years after the election of our first black president, right? Which even, as I'll show you, the Tea Partiers are excited about, by and large, right? They think that's a great example, proud to live in a nation, right? That is, uh, can have that example, can have the first, you know, it's a major sort of ceiling to break through. So we're just, you know, we're confused. <laughs> or we don't know how else to understand this. And I don't know if that's the same thing as confusion. Maybe we can talk about that if you're interested. But what that ends up meaning is that you see colorblindness throughout the political system. Okay, so I have just two examples. I'm just calling this liberal Chicago. I know liberal Chicago is much more encompassing and complicated and all that, but I'm just referencing those communities that I study, these racially diverse sort of, uh, uh, they're pro-diversity, they're pro sort of progressive politics, and then the Tea Party, which I didn't point this out, but you probably saw it on the slide. I just looked at organizers in this state, thinking that that has a way of kind of getting a read into the local politics and what other folks uh, that they're uh, doing their, their organizing work with our thinking. Um, so here is a guy that I'll call Todd uh, up in Chicago. He says, you know, people tend to segregate themselves by race, I think. That happens because, you know, it's just how chi Chinatown becomes Chinatown, which is not how Chinatown became Chinatown. <laughs> people tend to congregate with like people. This building becomes an African-American building because, you know, an African-American may own it. And he's just, hey, I got this friend. Okay, sure. 
they're, yeah, they got a job, they don't owe this and that and the other thing, their credit's okay, you know, move in. And these things just sort of happen. Okay. It can sound like I'm uh, picking on Todd or some of the other folks that I'll use in these examples here. To me, what it reveals is how much we don't know okay, about how Chinatown becomes Chinatown, for example. Right, or why we continue to have, even within these liberal communities, deep segregation within. Okay? And I heard a lot about in that research, you know, stay away from this block, right? and that sort of thing. Um, but to really, make, to, to really see how in this framework, Todd's relying on this race neutral, anything but race, anything but ongoing segregation, anything but institutional racism, right? cultural choice preference. You know, this is actually called the naturalization frame. This it says basically it's just natural. Right? If, you know, like attracts like. This is just the way, the way the world is. Right? I promise you on that racial inequality slide that I showed you, I don't think that's the way the world has to be. Right? And of course, then we can get in debate about how we change things. But, but there's, there's nothing natural about racial inequality. Okay? It's social, it's political. It's often unintentional, especially in the era of color blindness. But it, it continues to happen because of things that are going on in the social world, not the natural world. And the Tea Party. Okay, here's another expression of this colorblindness. And this is where everybody gets shocked, right? Because the Tea Party is supposed to be, you know, racist or whatever. So here is a woman that I, that I call Barb. She says, you know, one of the things that I want to say is that when the last presidential election process was going on, I really didn't know for sure who I was going to vote for. Right? I wasn't particularly fond of McCain, and I didn't feel that I knew enough about Obama, but I thought when he got elected, I thought this is great. For the first time, so I just kind of use this example, it's a salient one for me. For the first time, we have a black family in the White House, and I thought that was great. And the country, you know, that's a sign that we move beyond a lot of the racism. And we need to completely, and it needs to be done with. Okay. Those who are like already convinced that the Tea Party is like this one site, right? Because, you know, it, it, there's been a few problematic signs. You know, I could point to some of the same things that are taking place in liberal communities and so forth. You know, that, that like the racism is just here, right? And notice that none of this is racism. It's minimizing racism so that we're not able to understand racism, which is part of how it perpetuates itself, right? So there's definitely that very strong colorblind framework within the Tea Party that most folks, I think, would never expect to see there. The same thing is true, I think, another major way that, uh, and this is a great example, it's, it's incredibly racist, I want to show it to you with that caveat. So like when things like this circulate and gets attached to the Tea Party, people go, oh my gosh, the Tea Party's racist. So that's where some of this stuff comes from, right? But here up in you know, what I'm calling liberal Chicago, um, so sorry, let me back up a minute. Another major way that racism continues to operate is through codes. Right? We don't come right out and say that we're making associations between certain racial groups and, um, I don't know, this is, this is, I think, meant to imply that it's like somehow cheating the welfare system or things like that. Right? But we have a way around it, either through symbols, through language, or through other types of things. But again, it's not as though that this is somehow just isolated to one end of the political spectrum as opposed to others. Uh, here is Walter. Um, uh, up in uh, uptown in Chicago who said one of our issues here in this community is we have a lot of nursing homes and HUD buildings and section 8 buildings which are all good and needed okay there's that like good liberal flair to this color blindness the only problem is because of Alderman Schiller uh, down in the 46 she likes to attract them we've gotten over concentration and that's the wrong thing you think we learned that lesson when we created Cabrini Green and you're not doing these people any favor you're creating a, a, a jungle for them and they're the most victims because they're sitting and they don't have any choice, living in fear. And you know, we've just got too many and they should be more spread out. There's good housing policy that would support some of what he's saying. You know, most of the research has shown that extreme concentrated poverty in the inner city creates some forms of social problem and chaos and isn't ideal for economic, political, social, all sorts of reasons, right? So that, you know, I'm not saying that, that one opinion or another, I mean, that's kind of the whole point, is like easily sort of equated with this racism. But some of the language there, right, for these people, um, Walter was not the only one in this like pro-diversity liberal neighborhood up in Chicago who used this language of a jungle when referring to the predominantly black areas of the neighborhood. That's a racial code, okay? 
and it doesn't it's not necessarily decoupled from you know like those things are good and needed we need public housing that's a liberal uh, you know I don't want to simplify liberal or conservative either but you know so it's not as though we're just seeing it in one place in the political spectrum on the Tea Party um, so this is Jim he said if you take away from those who will and can work and are productive to, to give to those not that can't work I believe in welfare when our people need it those that truly can't work but just like I got an email the other day this lady says my grandma told me I'm the breadwinner for the family she's in her early 20s she's on her 10th pregnancy She's been pregnant basically every time she was eligible from her early teens. And what they did, this particular family, and I'm sure it's played out millions of times, she's having all these babies and claims that she can't take care of them, which everyone agrees, so she hands them over to DCFS. And then the grandmother says, well, I'll be foster parent. So then grandma gets these kids, so they're all staying in the same house. And I forget how many thousands of dollars per child. And she's making a lot better living than I am, doing absolutely nothing but making babies. That's just wrong. He didn't say a word about race, okay? Again, there's lots of research to show this. You know, I go into some of that detail in the book that I'm working on right now, uh, but it's been well established for years, the way that uh, discourse around welfare, and particularly um, perceptions of unfairness around welfare or potential for welfare abuse is, is coded, right? Black families come to mind. And I didn't have to just know that. After what he said, I, I was like, really? Because in my mind, right, I know that, that that's like, not how it works, that it's illegal, that there's no way that that's played out, though he's sure it's played out millions of times, right? So there's this very kind of careful racial coding that's taking place there. The day after our interview, he sent me the email that he had gotten, and sure enough, it's a picture, I didn't bring it, um, of a black woman surrounded by 10 children, right? And she has sort of like a, a little bit of a satisfied or a defiant look on her face, which if you really believe, right, that she's making a lot better living than I am, doing absolutely nothing, that would piss you off. Right? So I do think absolutely that there is some coded racism <laughs> clearly taking place within some parts of the Tea Party. Right? But it's the same thing is taking place okay, uh, among progressives in, in pr like we love diversity neighborhoods up in Chicago. See how I depress people for a living. <laughs> I think that the point though is not to depress you. Okay? but to really try to wrap our heads around where we are as a country. Because I, I fully believe, right, people throughout the political spectrum who say, I don't like racism. That's not the America that I fought my country for, or that I raised my kids to meaningfully contribute to, or that I was educated at this great institution, right, to try to like go out into the world and do something meaningful with. Nobody wants it, okay, but it's there. And I think we're very ambivalent about race in our society. So for you know, the liberals up in Chicago, you know, they take tremendous pride in diversity, but hold really tightly, even though it's sometimes in, in specific liberal ways, to these colorblind ideologies. Uh, they do what I, call, what I and others call identity work. You know, I'm one of the good ones. You know, uh, a lot of the stories about why people wanted to live or stay in these communities are saying, you know, I grew up in a really homogenous community. There was no diversity. I value diversity. <laughs> okay, and I, and I don't want to live someplace where it's just people who look like me or came from the same type of background as me or whatever, or whatever that may be. But like all of us, <laughs> myself included, okay, made housing choices based on opportunity and investment. Right? Wanting to be able to send their kids to decent schools because our educational system is so screwed up, I think, in this country. Right? That we don't have equal childhoods, and so we all want the best for our kids. So things, these sorts of disconnects are taking place. Um, and by and large, end up consuming diversity. Right? And that's either through, I love this neighborhood because I love the ethnic restaurants. Believe me, now that I'm down here in central Illinois, I would give anything for the Ethiopian neighborhood in my neighborhood back. So I'm not unlike some of these folks in that regard either. Right? But if we, call, if we say that's diversity, right? that that alone, I love diversity, people will say, even if it's not literal consumption through food or spending money, um, but through like just like I enjoy walking down the street and seeing, you know, it's also a, a, a neighborhood with a large immigrant population, you know, seeing the entire world walk by me, that's great. Right? I think that's better than not liking diversity. Again, that's just my opinion. <laughs> right? But that's not the same thing as really working to sustain diversity. And it's certainly not the same thing as racial or social justice. 
when we come to the tea party, right? Same thing. There's this proud claim. You know, I didn't really meet anyone who said, like, oh, yeah, I'm definitely a racist. Let me tell you all about it. Certainly we know that, that a lot that, um, and this is the same thing can happen in survey research or anything like that, a lot of folks, even if they are, won't uh, disclose. And as a researcher, I know that and I can make sense of it. But I believe them, actually, right? That by and large, we all hold these colorblind ideologies dear, okay? And really believe and want to live in an equal society. Know that it's not think that that's a bummer, right? And so the Tea Party is absolutely no different that I've been able to see, at least in this state, in that regard. But uh, like any political project, right, that some of that, for example, coded racism can get tapped to further policy goals, right? The same thing uh, would take place on the left, uh, certainly. Um, that I actually don't see any significant difference in the use of colorblind or coded racism from the liberal uh, Chicago community that I studied. So Tea Party racism, in my analysis, is just American racism. And I think we've got to be able to handle that, right? And not point fingers, you know, are you from a red state or a blue state, or are you, you know, a socialist or a Tea Party, you know, but, but to just be able to, to own that ambivalence because if we don't, right, my thinking and the thinking of many others who have come before me, okay, is that we're not actually going to get anywhere. We've already seen sort of a test of these colorblind frameworks and ideologies for the last several decades. It's not working, right? The racial inequality continues to persist, and now it's growing. Okay, so we need something more. We actually need to be able to think about how racial inequality really operates. And you can't do that without thinking about privilege, uh, institutional inequalities, and other sorts of things. Okay, but that's not where we are. And I'll, I'll, I'll come back around to that and actually talk about some of the good things that we're doing here on this campus and in this community as well. And I encourage you to share other examples. Um, but we're not like prepared for that because of the way that we talk about diversity. Okay, and that, you know, I, I should say, you know, you can probably already guess this about me um, from what you heard of it in my bio and maybe what you've gleaned already a little from uh, my talk so far. But the, you know, like this sort of like celebrating and embracing diversity. Yes, absolutely, I think that's crucial. It's not something we used to do, right? So I know sometimes it's like, oh, why do we have, you know, Black History Month or why is it the shortest month or any of that kind of, well, we didn't used to do much of that at all other than privately or in smaller spheres. We're getting better as institutions, as a nation, at embracing diversity. But if that's kind of where it stops and starts, um, we end up with things like, and I use this in my own work, a couple researchers at, uh, up in Minnesota have talked about what they call happy talk. Okay, so the glowingly positive ways that most people talk about diversity, which breaks down Okay, as soon as we try to make real meaning of it, because again, that's all we have, and it, and it alone doesn't work. Um, a discourse that's focused on diversity, uh, this is a woman who actually studied uh, some of the same neighborhoods that I did in, in my first book, um, actually can downplay efforts around social justice. Okay, because what we, did, what we tend to do is say, well, we've got diversity. What else do you need? What's our housing, education, um, economic, other kinds of policy? And, you know, we're investing in the neighborhood. Is it to put a mural up about how much we love diversity? Or is it to try to make it so that that diversity can remain? Right? And those, that's the disconnect that I think can come from this. Um, and I really am in strong dis disagreement with, with uh, a guy who's an otherwise really great sociologist and ethnographer, uh, Elijah Anderson, who recently came out with a book talking about how diverse spaces, diverse neighborhoods, he calls them cosmopolitan canopies, can just, you know, they just teach us tolerance. Right? We may not become friends, we may not alter our policy, we may not even get to, in fact, we probably won't get to know one another, but we'll tolerate each other a little bit better. Think about a time in your life where you felt that you're just being tolerated. And please tell me that's not me right now. <laughs> right, because no one likes to be tolerated. Right, so that's something different than real meaningful equality, justice, change, community, relationships, any of that kind of stuff that matters so deeply in our lives. Okay, this has been called ornamental multiculturalism, right? Like, I always think like ornaments that you can hang on a Christmas tree, 
right? And we're all gonna put like these nice rainbow, kumbaya, let's hug it out, right? An important part of the process, but if that's all we have, right? And Margaret Anderson has called this, uh, in fact, a diversity without oppression. <laughs> which again, you know, she's saying it doesn't get us very far. She says that losing a focus on racial inequality may be especially likely in institutional settings where there's some inclusion of diverse groups, but where the institutions remain structured on the needs and experiences of the dominant groups. So for me as a white person, right, in a, in a diverse community, on a diverse college campus, right, so much of it is still, even if it's not always the design, sometimes built around, do I feel good? Can I congratulate myself? Is my world opening up? Right? Am I expanding my own horizons? And again, I think those are all worthy goals. But if we're not thinking about how um, the needs and experiences of those who aren't the dominant groups maybe aren't being addressed or aren't be given, or being given equal importance, right? that's where, again, some of these problems can continue to persist. You know, so, I think, and others think, um, I wrote a piece, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my website at the end if you want to go and read it for yourself, about how privilege really has to be, even though nobody really likes, well, except for me, talking about it, <laughs> and many others as well, right? So it's not as though like we really don't want to talk, but privilege makes us uncomfortable, right? So when we're talking about white privilege, uh, it means lots of things uh, historically and institutionally, right? Being white has meant the ability to become a citizen, up until 1950, uh, legally in our society, there were ways around it, uh, to own property, access to immigration, owning or renting in the most desirable and profitable neighborhoods, access to the best schools, and a whole host of other legal, political, and financial benefits. Not because I want it, not because I'm a good or a bad person, but just because that is how our social, economic, political world has been put together, okay, up until the civil rights movement, pretty overtly, in our society, and that wasn't that long ago, <laughs> okay? And so it takes time to recover. We talk about the generational impact, the cumulative impact of that past inequality. It all still matters today, right? But no matter what our intentions are, no matter whether or not we like it, and that impacts also our daily lives. So for me as a white person, right? The ability to just be seen as an individual right? That I'm supposedly not marked by race, even though me being white structures my day and my opportunities to the very same degree as it does for people of color. It just tends to do so invisibly. That's how privilege works. That's how male privilege works, right? There's how all different systems of privilege work, right? That, in fact, part of the reason <laughs> that I think I've had some success teaching and writing about this stuff is I'm not seen as biased. Doesn't seem like a special interest for me. Right? That's the kind of thing we need to be able to look at and scrutinize. Okay? Of course it's biasing, <laughs> right? Your perception of me. Same thing, you know, I always use the example. I'm, I'm glad we had Target on the other slide. I should have put it on there for this slide as well. I love going to Target. Um, and I'm very nervous now about the data that is being collected on me. Um, I know I'm not pregnant. So <laughs> sorry for those of you that weren't in the in the last session, that won't make a lot of sense. Uh, but <laughs> but I'm also really bad at um, like, if I buy something in the store, like cutting out the little tag that like sets off on the inside of your clothing that after you purchased it, right, <laughs> that sets off the alarm, right? So I feel like I'm always setting off those stupid beepers. I don't know if I'm the only one that has that experience, but it happens all the freaking time, right? And it's a pain. Um, but like, when, when I set off the beepers, and I haven't stolen anything, but even if I had, right, oh, I'm so sorry, right? Because I have sort of a middle classish like, look to me, I'm a young white woman, there are perceptions about what that means, right? It doesn't mean that every time, let's say, a young black woman or a Latina or someone else would have that same experience, that they're always gonna be stopped, right? But we see patterns emerge in that kind of behavior, right? Um, so there's, there's, there's just so in ways that benefit me, right? In fact, so many times I've gotten the go on ahead thing that I just don't stop anymore. I kind of do a little pause and look behind, but if no one, I just kind of keep going because no one usually cares, okay? And whether or not that sound, you know, uh, enforcement policy to store, no, <laughs> right? Same thing if you think about racial profiling, uh, you know, in a whole host of other institutional settings. Um, but these have benefits, right? And they disguise also the cost for people of color. And if we're not really looking at how those systems operate, 
who receives privilege or benefits or disadvantages, whose day is constantly interrupted by reminders of their racial status, right? It almost never happens to me. I, as a white person, I have to think about it. As a woman, it's really easy. I, I bump up against that all day long, right? Because that's a system where I have this disadvantage. Right? But if we're not looking at how those systems are put together, then we're not really going to be able to unravel or change the inequality that, again, I sincerely believe that no one wants. Okay? So I think that we need race consciousness and not colorblindness. I think that'll help us have more meaningful discussions in what is supposed to be a democracy. HUD, by the way, I, I read today is, is I think 96% shut down, so the funding for my research wouldn't have been there in this political moment, right? But, um, but we, you know, imagine what, I mean, imagine what it would be like to have real conversations about this stuff in our country. We're not doing it, right? And I think that race consciousness and other consciousness of other forms of uh, inequalities, right? class, gender, sexuality, and a whole host of other systems and how they work together. If we're not getting to that wonderful how question that I think we're so good at in sociology and, and in other disciplines that do some similar things, right, then we're not going to really be able to unravel it. And the point for me is never to feel guilty. Yeah, I think that we should all be scrutinizing the way our assumptions, the way that, uh, that we make choices and that our choices are reflected back. You know, I think we all need to be self-critical, but not just like to feel bad, <laughs> right? Because you're white, for example. Right? I don't know about you guys, but when I do something wrong, when I do feel bad, I close in, I get really quiet, I don't want any attention focused on, right? That's not gonna be productive. That's not gonna, and I don't wanna assume I operate the same way, but I think a lot of us can relate to that, right? The guilt is gonna shut us down but responsibility can move us forward, okay? So if we can responsibly understand how the world is put together, right, then we might be able to change it. And only this will create real equality and a genuine space for the sharing of culture and difference, and we can actually live like those pretty posters that we look at. You know, this, this is the last line, so I'm plagiarizing myself again a little bit here, I suppose. Uh, I should have cited it. Um, but uh, this is the last line from that article that, that you can go read if you want to. If diversity, discourse, and efforts and inclusion don't include a serious and open discussion of colorblindness, racism, white privilege, including the many ways that these realities intersect with other identities and oppressions, our racial ambivalence, right, this messy, we know something's wrong, we don't know what to call it, we don't know how to talk about it, right, that's going to continue. So it's time to shed this ambivalence own our racial past and present, and begin to engage the equal opportunity that so many of us in this country claim we're vested in. I know that sounds really big and fuzzy and impossible, but we're doing, and yes, this is something of a plug for the program that I helped to develop and direct here. But here at Illinois Wesleyan, we're doing that. Okay, I sit, that's part of the reason that I shared with Carlo when he asked for some stuff for my bio, information about some of the committees that I sit on. I sit in every, well, nearly every one of those meetings. I'm in sabbatical right now. Um, and I know how seriously we take those efforts around diversity, inclusion, social justice, all that stuff that's crucial to our, uh, to our, our identity on this campus that makes you so proud to be an alum. And it makes us honored that you come back here and still want to be part of this community. We mean it, right? And one of the ways that we work to try to take those kinds of difficult steps that are really going to get us there on this campus is through starting to shift our focus, not just from, yay, we're really happy, and we are, that we have increasing diversity on this campus. But what happens when folks get here? Are they going to be supported? Are they going to want to stay? Are the white students just going to feel like, you know, diversity isn't about them? Or that diversity isn't something that they can participate in meaningfully, right? And so we're engaging diversity program that just, uh, it's, in, it's in its fourth year, I suppose, right now. These are two photos from this year's program. Um, it sounds totally counterintuitive. It's an all-white diversity program. That always sounds a little odd to people at first. Happens for incoming. Uh, first-year students at the same time as the Milana and the International Student Orientation, and we focus very, very seriously on diversity. You know, white privilege is a big part of that. Again, not to make students come in like before they even turn Titan and feel bad about being white, but to feel excited about 
building relationships across the color line, getting to know folks from other countries, coming into this community and wanting to make a real difference, okay, and to make genuine relationships across the color line that we know improve retention and, and improve the experiences for students of color, for our international students, and then help us really build real community here. Okay, the friendships that, that you know better than the current students, you know, that last and they continue to be meaningful uh, for your life. And the students speak very positively about it. This is, uh, this is part of our morning breakfast session where they're talking about their homework. We give them homework before classes even start, and we have a lot of uh, interesting discussions about this. This is a discussion that we did with the Milana students after the uh, privilege walk, which if you're curious, I can tell you more about what that is, but a very kind of honest discussion about differences and similarities that we find from different racial, socioeconomic, and other kinds of backgrounds. And the students speak very positively about it. Okay, we think that it's enhancing their experience. So I only say that to say that it's not actually so fuzzy and impossible to get away from this color blindness thing, to really talk meaningfully uh, about difference, about diversity, about our identities, about where we come from, about our perspectives and experiences. In fact, we know that that's what we're here to do. Right? So our thinking is that if we can really own that and embrace it, and this is just one institution, right? things like this could take place in the workplace, things like this could take place in neighborhoods and communities, in social groups of all sorts, right? then we're really able, we find so far, <laughs> to break through and try to really make some positive change that again, I think that we all embrace and can feel proud of. So with that, I will stop. <laughs> I warmly welcome your questions. If you want to email me, please, please do. You can go, uh, I have my articles and stuff and, and some links for, for my work and other things about what I'm doing up on a website here. Um, but I'd love to hear your questions or comments. Yeah. So I worked in the civil rights movement in Chicago in the 60s. Yeah. Got a social work degree and then moved to Texas. Yeah. Uh, and uh, as a private practice uh, around Fort Hood. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to watch what happens when you have a, an authoritative organization uh, because early they struggled a lot with racial and then more recently women in there. Mm -hmm. um, but you do begin to see people forming social relationships around their work and very much However, in the community, yeah. it remains, you go to Sunday or segregated as any place in the world, mm -hmm. uh, that phenomenon. Right. Uh, housing patterns are very much mixed. Uh, yeah. The kids are much better at it than us. Mm -hmm. uh, Right, and that's a little troubling, is it? Because we want to say, like, let's bring in, like, some, let's have people just tell us. <laughs> and I know, I know the military is more complex than that. Um, but actually, the military has has been held up as an example, right? In part through the reality that it uh, that it tends to attract and recruit folks from all walks of life, um, and in part because of some of its own affirmative action or diversity policies, that it becomes a place where some of that really um, those walls really tend to break down. Um, and people, like you say, do find those genuine connections once we can get to that place. So uh, it's a question of how do we get ourselves there, even if we're not in the military or in some of these other authoritative institutions, like you say. Yeah. And I, I was here in the late 60s, and I must say that the discussion of race consciousness was at an all-time high. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and not, and not enough. Right. 
uh, the student population has made great strides, right. both in domestic ethnic diversity and certainly in international mm -hmm. events, which a lot of us have been working on. Yeah, yeah. But my question would be that, you know, the University of Hong Kong, we call it the different rivers. We have the river of Cantonese speakers, the river of Mandarin speakers, and the river of English speakers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll say the Greek system is not something I know much about. I don't have a lot of contact with that. There's always relationships and conversations that are that are here on campus to try to deal with some of that. The reason I raised it is I, I met a Chinese student who had actually come to KP. Okay. And I was stunned. It's like, wow, an international student from Chicago to KP. Yeah. Really incredible for West End. So I'm wondering about that because, you know, that, you know there's forms of white privilege here on campus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, before I address that, do you want to jump in? I think there's no denying we've made a lot of progress, and that's on a lot of fronts. Um, uh, but I think that all of that points to the kind of effort that I really believe in that's reflected to some extent in our Engaging Diversity program. And other types of diversity work that we're doing on campus is that if we're not focusing on the climate that these students are coming into, right, then we're not going to see the real reprieve. And, and let me tell you, things still happen. You know. Um, when I have my office hours, when I'm not on sabbatical like I am right now, they're often filled with students coming in and sharing stories that are um, really unfortunate stories about things that are happening at parties, things that are happening on the quad, things that are happening sometimes even in the classroom. Right? Tell, t why don't you give us the black experience? Right? On, on, or what's the, what's the black perspective on you? Know, that's not okay. <laughs> Right, because there is no singular black experience and all that kind of stuff. So there's definitely, you know, we made a lot of progress. There's a lot of progress yet to be made, but that's where I think if we can really focus on, and it's part of our strategic plan. We're in the process of revising that right now, um, but really kind of looking to strengthen it and make it even more clear and direct about the ways that we want to um, be able to have a welcoming and supportive climate here on campus. Otherwise, you know, faculty of color sometimes haven't stayed, right? Uh, students may not want to come and stay, may not tell other students how great their educational experience, which we're still hearing it absolutely is here at Illinois Wesleyan. You know, but I know a lot of students of color who even after their four years, and, and I'm only in my fifth year here, right, will say, I loved it, I had a great experience, I'm not sure if I'd tell my friend to come here. Right, so there's work to be done, and that's where we think that if we can begin to focus on, get away from the color blindness, yes, we celebrate, diversity, multiculturalism, but what else can we do to kind of check some of those assumptions and get us to think a little bit more broadly and inclusively than we think we're going to begin. And we're already starting to see um, some real traction there. Yeah. It's funny, during the presentation that came before, I was sitting back there thinking, I am so not big data. <laughs> you know, because I'm not. You know, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not claiming that I can say everything about sort of liberal white America any more than I can say that I'm speaking about the Tea Party as a national movement. Um, you know, it's very much focused on these local environments and trying to see how they shape the outcomes. I also know it's not all roses, and I love California. If I could pick this school up <laughs> and move <laughs> all of us, all of you, to California, I'd do it in a heartbeat. But it's not all roses, right? So there's still then going to be some things in our national climate that are going to impact, yeah. So that's the stuff we need to work on, I think. Yeah. When I was here, I was an exchange student at Stallman College in Atlanta, Georgia, and two students from Stallman came for second semester. Does that program still exist, or did it have to be You know, I don't know offhand. Yeah. 
though, the, though there's, there's um, although that program doesn't exist anymore, um, I think in some ways um, we have many, many efforts going on throughout campus where there's, so we, we just started a new, uh, it was very much like this sort of grassroots efforts among faculty, staff, and students, and alum, I assume, um, on this campus who um, started this new Center for Human Rights and Social Justice. So there's a sphere, and, and I don't have much to do with them. I'm very supportive of them, but I wasn't part of that. I'm not deeply connected to that. You know, I think I'll end up cross-listing some of my courses with it. But there's lots of, and I think that's encouraging too, lots of really great efforts, lots of programs, uh, and I may not even hear of, of all of them, that are, that are, I think, collectively working toward this goal. Again, I think because we do take it so seriously, and we, we are sincere in our efforts. We just have to be, I think, self-critical about what is and isn't working so we can adjust, but. We can yeah. invite the administration I think our I think our administration now is very different. They've been very supportive of, of these types of efforts. So I would be shocked if something. So that's good news, right? I'd be shocked if they're if we got that kind of reaction now. Even though it's a shame it doesn't exist. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. I mean, honestly, I would love, I would love to hear many more of your stories um, and all of that. And for those of you that don't know, and this I guess speaks to both talks, you're all welcome. Um, we're having a sociology anthropology. Have you heard about our wine and cheese thing tomorrow at five? <laughs> I hope you join us. Yeah, it's right uh, second floor of CLA at the end of the hallway, kind of outside of where our offices are. Um, the Center for Liberal Arts. So if you come in from the quad, you're coming into the second floor. Just walk down the hallway, five to six tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know that we're beyond time. I know it's Friday afternoon, and uh, many of you have, have sat through two presentations now. So with that, I'll go ahead and close, but I'll definitely hang around if anyone wants to talk. Um, I've got cards. You've got my email. So I hope the conversation can continue. Again, thank you for being here. Welcome back to campus. Uh, there's so much that you're, that you're